Uh, I apologize for the screen name on mine. It says Abby, that's my daughter. I'm using her computer and I can't get the screen name to change. But this is Katherine Cranston, okay? <laughs> Michelle, we're good. At what point right. should okay. should I turn off my camera and my mute? I know we talked about it earlier and I forgot. You can turn them off now, Becky, and we'll let you know when to come back on. Sound. Thank you. All right, it is 6.03 and I'd like to call to order the February 23rd, 2021 regular meeting of Independent School Board 622. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. So can I get a motion and a second to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Okay, moved by, I didn't. Martins. There's a lot of people on the Zoom today. Oh, it was by Julia. Okay. Oh, Martin, sorry. So moved by Martin, second by Livingston. All in favor say aye. And we still need to do roll calls. So Kim, can you call a roll? Yes. Caleb Anderson. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Julia Martins. Aye. Charlotte Natardi. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. So we have an approved agenda. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the achievement awards. So we have two achievement awards tonight um, and Nancy Livingston will be presenting those awards. Um, Nancy, do you have what you need for that? You're on mute, Nancy. First, okay. And then I'll go and call them up. All right, here we go. The school board of the North St. Paul Maplewood Oakdale School District is proud of its students, citizens, and staff who demonstrate service above and beyond the call of duty. We are proud to recognize the following individuals. District 622 Health Ser Services Supervisor Alicia Gustafson has been nominated for her work during the COVID pandemic. Besides completing her regularly assigned duties, Alicia has gone above and beyond the call of duty by attending daily or weekly MDH and MDE, that's Minnesota Department of Health and Minnesota Department of Education, information sessions on COVID related topics, conducting contract tracing for employees and students affected by COVID-19, providing COVID related trainings located and securing COVID-related supplies and essential PPE, personal protective equipment, as well as handling an unending stream of individual calls from staff and parents regarding health and safety during a very uncertain time. Alicia's skills go beyond the logistical tasks of her job. She projects a warm, cheerful attitude, no matter the intensity or seriousness of the situation. We have seen her resolve conflicts and handle other difficult situations with remarkable patience and professionalism. Alicia extends herself to help support others, lifting the spirits of those around her. Her passion for her health services staff and love of her profession are apparent when engaging in the challenging discussions and planning around the pandemic. We have never worked with a person who gives as much attention to detail as Alicia. These characteristics represent all that is good and we are fortunate to have her as part of the District 622 community. <clears throat> Alicia is nominated by Tricia St. Michaels, Director of Student Services. Nikki, Nikki Kleinberg, uh, uh, the, that's the English Language Supervisor. Jill Kenton, the Special Ed Supervisor. Sue Bartling, Harmony Supervisor. Heather Kosek, 
Next Step Supervisor, Julie Kohler, Special Ed Supervisor, Dana Strop, the ECSE Supervisor, and Dwayne Wiesty, Special Ed Supervisor. Congratulations, Alicia. All right, are we gonna pause there? So I forge right along here. Okay. If I could just add a little comment. We have this beautiful certificate for Alicia Gustafson, yeah. uh, our lead nurse extraordinaire. I don't know, does it show up backwards when you see it? No, nope, we can see it good. Thank oh, you. Good, because on my screen, it looks backwards. But um, normally, Alicia, in a real live in-person board meeting, we'd be all calling you up right now for some photo ops. But um, I'd like to pause if we couldn't just give Alicia a moment to say a word or two. Um, Alicia has been in the thick of it, day and night, uh, weekends, evenings, Saturdays, Sundays, and all um, with a smile on her face. So Alicia, do you wanna just say a word or two? Yeah, you missed the, you missed all the tears that have also happened because this is a really hard year for everybody. So I couldn't have done it without the team who nominated me and the people who I work with, my health services staff, all the nurses, um, the detail oriented piece does not come from me. I will tell you that it's the support of my team. So thank you for that, but I cannot take ownership. Um, like they said, I love what I do. I'm here for the kids and only for the kids and the health and safety of the kids. So thank you. Hey, Alicia, we've, we've heard that you're a rock star. So mm -hmm. the superintendent brags about you all the time. So, <laughs> thank you. Yes. so congratulations. Thank you. All right. So I'm forging ahead here. All right. Oh, here's here's my buddy, Catherine Cranston. <clears throat> she has worked diligently to train our students and staff in restorative practices. Restorative practices are all about the making, maintaining, and when things go wrong, repairing relationships. Catherine is a top-notch restorative practices trainer known regionally for her outstanding work. She has worked tirelessly to train our bus drivers and bus monitors, support staff, teachers, specialists, coaches, administrators, after school care staff, and others to bring to life restorative practices in our district. The critical work directly impacts student learning through relationship building and problem solving together with students and staff. The training and support keep students engaged in learning and not missing instructional time. Thank you, Catherine, for going above and beyond and doing tremendous work. Catherine is nominated by Assistant Superintendent Troy Miller. All right. Congratulations. So this is the wonderful certificate that Catherine will be getting. Um, Yay. You all remember Catherine because Catherine did a presentation for our board. She also shared with you that she's a school board member herself in Somerset, Wisconsin. So you got to have a little connection with that. And uh, Catherine has utterly changed practices in our school district, just unbelievably so with her work. So Catherine, do you want to say a word or two? Sure. Um, First, I, um, I have to apologize. I don't even have my own name up there, but uh, I turned in my computer today because today uh, is my final, uh, was my final day. I retired today at four o'clock. So it's kind of funny that this meeting was right now. <laughs> so I, I left my computer um, in my office and I'm not sure if all of you realize my office is in the bus garage. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just an absolute honor to have the uh, opportunity to do this. And so I spent a lot of time today saying goodbye. And um, I just have to tell you a, a really quick story that I, I had to, I was in a lot of buses today, just on and off buses. And one of the bus drivers just started to cry, Aww. the kangaroo bus driver. And what she said to me just made, made it worth it for me for everything. She said, Catherine, you've been a game changer for us. And, you know, what more do you want than someone to tell you that you made that big of a difference? 
Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I, I, I felt so wonderful about leaving, uh, leaving the, and I'm leaving them in good hands. We have a good person, Whitney Kentrell, who's taking uh, my place. But, um, and I, I, I want to thank Christine and Troy because uh, without their support, this never, ever would have happened. And they just let me run with it and didn't micromanage me, let me do my thing and get it set up. And so um, I really thank you for that. Um, and I'm just hoping that we're leaving it in good reins. Um, and uh, Nancy, I know we go back a long, long way and <laughs> it all boils down to relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think if I could just make a comment, um, I think this is a case of, of our leaders, Christine and Troy, recognizing um, the skills of a, was it fourth grade, Catherine? Fifth, fourth yep, grade thought, teacher yep. mm -hmm. at Webster Elementary School who was doing fabulous work with her fourth graders, but, but had additional skills that we could tap into. And we, and, and we recognized that and, and, and let her run with it. And I just think it's just um, awesome that that partnership happened and uh thank you so much i know you leave a legacy right this isn't yeah. over you leave a legacy of uh, of that kind of uh communication right and uh respect and uh i really really thank you for all you've done thank you you're welcome thank you for this honor mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Nancy. And thanks again to Alicia and Catherine. Um, thanks also to those of you who nominated um, Alicia and Catherine. We love hearing these stories, so keep them coming. Um, next on our agenda, we have public comment. So this is an opportunity for the public to share their thoughts. Um, speakers have emailed the superintendent's office prior to the meeting, and each speaker has up to four minutes. Um, when the speakers begin, please state your name and address. And I know tonight we have two speakers for public comment. And our first is Greg Big. So Greg, can you state your name and your address? And then you have up to four minutes. And currently you're on mute, Greg. Uh, yes, Greg Bigwood. Uh, 1594 Ivy Avenue North in Lake Elmo. And first and foremost, thank you for your time today. I, I do appreciate it and realize that your time is valuable in a long meeting and virtual meetings get even longer. So thank you for that. Quick introduction to myself. Um, again, my name is Greg Bigwood. I'm vice president of the Tartan Hockey Association, but more importantly, I'm the father of a, a junior at Tartan. My Daughter Nolia plays tennis, lacrosse, and hockey. And I, I come to you tonight to ask for your consideration in adopting the reduced quarantine that is laid out in the MDH sports, sports quarantine clarification document that was released just this last Friday. I realize this isn't on the agenda and for obvious reasons that it certainly your agenda was finalized prior to this memo coming out. But my hope is that you would consider adding this either in new business as a motion or during the superintendent's COVID report. This memo allows for a shortened quarantine in accordance with some of the CDC guidelines of seven days instead of the 14. Now, this quarantine memo is timely because just today we found out that our girls hockey team from North Tartan was asked to quarantine. This is their second quarantine in this season with not a single girl on the team testing positive. Realizing that things move fast, benefits consulting and, and working with my clients on an almost daily basis to understand the, the COVID guidelines, but it's important to consider these and take this into strong consideration in passage. Again, I appreciate your time and thank you for the consideration of this shortened quarantine. Okay. 
thank you, Greg. And as you stated, I think Christine, our superintendent, uh, Christine Tuccio Osorio, will um, address this issue yep. during her COVID updates. I appreciate that. Uh, thank thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you, and Dr. Osorio. Next, next up for public comment, we have Ann Hackman. And Ann, can you just state your name and your address, and then you have up to four minutes. Okay. Hi, I'm Ann Hackman, uh, 6860 29th Street Circle um, in Oakdale. Um, I am also part of the uh, Tartan Area Hockey Association's board. Um, I'm the treasurer on the board, but I am also a parent of a daughter on the team that is being quarantined. Um, like Greg said, we, we were informed as a hockey association last Friday that there was some new rules that the MDH had put out. And when we heard that our teams were quarantined today, we were kind of disappointed that they weren't the same rules that they had put out last week. Um, we agree it probably wasn't on your agenda because it had just come out, but we're, we're here to hope that somehow we can get the rules changed to limit the quarantine of our girls and hopefully get them back on the ice as soon as we can. Um, if we end up being quarantined for 14 days, unfortunately, the girls would lose six games, and that would be kind of disappointing. We had a, a senior day planned for the, the older girls, and so we're hoping that the rules can be changed and the policies can be changed to shorten that. Of course, if, you know, if one of our girls does, does end up with COVID, you know, we're, we know that there are other policies, and we will take care of that, but we're hoping that you'll take this into consideration. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Kim, we just had two public comment, right? Kim? That is correct. Just the two. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, next on our agenda is the consent agenda. So the consent agenda is designed to expedite the handling of routine and miscellaneous official business of the board. The entire agenda may be adopted by the board in one motion. The motion for adoption is not debatable and must receive unanimous approval. By request of an individual board member, an item can be removed from the consent agenda and placed upon the regular agenda for consideration and action. So on the consent agenda tonight, we have A, minutes of the January 26, 2021 business meeting, B, minutes of February 20th, 2021 board retreat, C, routine personnel, D, change orders, E, bid award, F, bus purchase, G, disbursement. So are there any items that a board member would like removed from the consent agenda for discussion? Michelle, I would like to pull uh, B, the board retreat minutes. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay, then I'm gonna read the resolution with the remaining items. So be it resolved by the School Board of Independent School District number 622 that consent agenda item 5A, C, D, E, F, and G be approved as written, and a copy of the agenda item is attached to the minutes. So can I get a motion and a second for approval of the consent agenda? So, so moved. Second. Okay, moved by Livingston, second by Hunt. All in favor say aye, and Kim, please call the roll. Caleb Anderson. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Julia Martins. Aye. Charlotte Natardi. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay, so items A, C, D, E, F, G are approved. And let's go back to item B, which was the board retreat minutes. And Steve, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, the board retreat is a significant piece of uh, board work. It's an opportunity for us to get together and, and work in a slightly less formal, 
more interactive way. And I thought that um, this evening would be a good opportunity for either the chair or the superintendent to just give a really brief overview of the work we did um, at our recent board retreat so the public has sort of, a, of an idea of the type of things that we work on in our retreat process. And some of the, uh, because I think that we did some significant work in both the morning session and the afternoon session. And I um, would just like to have an opportunity to have that shared with the public was the only reason I pulled that item. Uh, great, thanks, Steve. Um, you know, I can share the first part of the board retreat, and I appreciate those comments, Steve, because I did feel that the board retreat um, was, you know, it wasn't super long, but it was, it was powerful for our team. I thought um, we worked with Gail Gilman and Paula O'Loughlin from MSBA, and we worked on um, board governance as well as board self-evaluation. And it was an opportunity for the board members to get to know each other better, which has been really difficult to do over Zoom with uh, new board members coming on. And you know we don't get a lot of bonding time. So I thought it was a nice exercise. It was nice to hear from everyone. And the second half of the meeting, um, the superintendent, Christine Tucciosorio gave us some updates um, on some policies, as well as the strategic plan. Am I missing anything? Does anybody else want to weigh in on that? If I could just add, you know, our board's been really engaging in, um, <clears throat> you know, some deep dive work. Uh, our strategic plan was last passed in the spring, uh, I mean, the December of 2016. And um, our initial conversation this past weekend was to start thinking ahead to how and when to revamp that strategic plan and update it again. And so um, I, we would have probably been deeper into it uh, had we not had been hit by a pandemic. So we are in the middle of um, discussing now a potential timeline for that. And we really want to see uh, broad community engagement in that conversation and planning. So kind of what the future of District 622 should look like. So. Uh, part of the conversation was taking a, a look into what that timeline might look like. So, All right, thanks, Christine. Ben, did you have something? Yeah, I, I took the minutes for the meeting and I had, there were two takeaways that I wrote down in the minutes. Um, number one, um, the people that led our morning session from the Minnesota School Board Association, they took minutes on our session. And I believe they had some, uh, also some feedback that they were going to kind of put together into a package and send over to Kim. Um, and I, I, I think it would be in our best interest, you know, when that comes back to review that, maybe at a work session sometime down the line, um, just to kind of see if they had anything else that, you know, we didn't get time to look at or talk about. Um, Cause it was a huge list of questions and there's probably a lot of things that we didn't get to touch on. And it, it was just, it was a really good start um, that I think we can keep working with. Um, and then the other thing too is uh, Christine presented the draft of the uh, equity policy that we've been working on. And um, I believe one of the takeaways for us was to, you know, take a look at what's there, what we have for a draft. And if anybody has any feedback, um, you know, provide that to Christine or Sharice um, or, or Kim so that we can, you know, keep working on this. Uh, policy so it's ready to go and it's the best it can possibly be. All right, great. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Charlotte? Yeah. Um, um, can I do Charlotte and I'll come right back to you, Nancy? Sure. Uh, okay. Piggybacking off what Ben just said, um, the MSBA uh, individual that helped facilitate our morning meetings did come with, come up with our strengths and also areas of improvement. And so, I, yeah, exactly what Ben just said. We're gonna get some, some areas that we need to work on as a board and uh, they're gonna give that to us because that's really what the result, what, of what the self-evaluation was about that we spent uh, most of the morning talking about. 
Great. Thanks, Charlotte. All right, Nancy? I just wanted to add that the retreat was valuable in another way, which was um, it was kind of onboarding for our two new board members who are just excellent. And that's Charlotte Natardi and Julia Martins. And, you know, we haven't been able to spend, you know, in-person time with these wonderful individuals. So it was really great that we could get um, in a day-long session more of a sense of their skills and their interests and their passions. And um, it's a real, we have a really interesting board. I mean, we all come with, you know, different age and ethnicities and skills and whatever, but um, I'm really impressed that we bring um, a passion for uh, public education and for students. And, um, and in a high anxiety time, we're willing to come together and step up and do this work. And I, I think uh, it kind of recharged our batteries <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to, be, uh, to be board members. And uh, so I really appreciated uh, that session. Thank you. All right, any other comments? Okay, if not, then we, I'm gonna make a motion for approval of item B. So be resolved by the School Board of Independent School District number 622 that consent agenda item 5B be approved as written. Um, can I get a motion and a second for that approval? So okay. moved. Second. Okay, moved by, was it Livingston and second by Hunt, I think? Okay. It was not. No? No. Okay. Who made the motion? Um, I, <laughs> I think I, I uh, was the first one. Caleb, okay. okay. So moved by Anderson and second by Hunt. Okay, all in favor say aye and Kim, please call the roll. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Glenn Jarman. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Julia Martins. Aye. Charlotte Natardi. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. All right. Thanks, everyone. That motion is approved as well. Um, before we move on to reports, Christine, did you want to make a quick introduction? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just share with you um, part of what we didn't get a chance to go into very well at our board retreat this past weekend was just that there's um, we've been doing a little bit of restructuring in our Department of Teaching and Learning um, because, um, and I'll talk about this a little more when we get into our COVID conversation, um, we have really needed to ramp up our support and development of our broader online learning program. And so we have, Sean Cotterman was doing that work and then stepped in to kind of cover the Department of Teaching and Learning as well. Um, and we have needed to pull him back to the online world entirely because it's just become so all encompassing. And with that, um, I'm very pleased to share that Heidi Lee has uh, stepped up as our interim director of teaching and learning. We purposely chose Heidi because it's not a change. She's already been doing a lot of the work anyway. She manages our title one and title all our title funds and has very involved with all of our principals um, and is highly respected. Um, in our department. And so just wanted you to kind of see a, no, uh, a new face on our on our cabinet team here, but um, Heidi has graciously stepped up into this role um, to help us collaborate beyond just the, uh, the online world, but just with our whole Department of Curriculum Instruction. And she's been an active person in this leadership role already. So this just kind of elevates her role a little bit. So wanted to introduce Heidi and, and give her a chance to say a quick hello as well. Yes, good evening and thank you, Chair Yenner, members of the board, Superintendent Tucci Osorio and the cabinet. It is such a joy and honor to be here tonight and I'm so grateful at the opportunity to continue to support our district while in the role of the Interim Director of Teaching and Learning. And I look forward to our continued collaboration and partnership. Thank you. Heidi, if you don't know where her office is, she shares a wall with me and she's on the other side of my office wall. So. Now I can bang on the wall all the time. Heidi, hey, we got to talk yes. about what we already do anyway. But, so it's a pretty natural uh, space for us to be in. But I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into um, the COVID update as well. All right. Thanks, Christine. And congratulations, mm -hmm. Heidi. Um, next on our agenda, we have reports. And first, we have our student school board representatives, Manny and Evan. Um, who wants to go first? 
Uh, I can go ahead and go first. All right, great, thanks. All right. Um, essentially, around this time, the biggest thing that's creating a little bit of excitement in both students and teachers is our return to uh, hybrid learning for those who choose so. Uh, just discussing over, I mean, social media with students, then mostly Zoom or email with teachers. Uh, I can see excitement on both sides as to seeing faces again and just walking the halls again. Everything is creating excitement around around both students and teachers. Um, but with that comes the end of second try. Uh, finals will be next week, I believe, well, Monday and Tuesday. And then, uh, then after that, of course, spring break. And the late work deadline is approaching on the 25th of February. That's, of course, I mean, there's activities such as boys basketball. I believe they face off against South St. Paul today after having a uh, slight uh, a sort of a roadblock with uh, COVID and things like that. They've only played six games this season uh, and most of the teams have played 10, I believe, but they hope to get back on track tonight. And lastly, I'd like to say uh, congratulations, Heidi. Um, cause I remember you from, uh, our, I hope you don't leave us in our little advisor group as well. Cause I remember and just congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not leaving. <laughs> All right. Glad to hear that. All right. Thanks, Manny. Uh, Evan. Yeah. I mean, kind of, kind of going off what Manny said, I sort of feel like, a. I mean, Groundhog Day at this point with my reports, there's not really too much to talk about beyond the fact, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of excitement and buzz around this uh, return to hybrid. And it seems like students do like the new schedule. They like having the Fridays off. That's sort of a, something I've been hearing. Uh, but other than that, Tartan Theater is getting ready for their production. Uh, that's going to be next week, I believe, because Tech Week is coming up. They're doing an Alice in Wonderland. Uh, us on the knowledgeable team, uh, we have two teams that made it to the regions meet, uh, which is with teams within the metro region. Uh, we're hoping to make a run for state. Uh, student council has been working hard throughout the winter to get students engaged, find activities, sort of celebrate incoming week with uh, different themes and things like that. Uh, and then finally, I mean, sports are, are kind of just, they're kind of going. I mean, like we heard earlier, there have been some roadblocks with having to quarantine. And I know uh, for my family, personally, my brother's on the hockey team and we're trying to find a balance between what we believe is like, is this, is this a little excess? Is this too much? Is, or, you know, are we just lucky that he's actually getting to play sort of those conflicts? I imagine a lot of other families are torn between feeling like the some of the measures are in excess and they're too much and they're a little pointless or that it's good that their kids are safe and they're lucky that they're out there on the ice or the court uh or what have you all right thanks evan does anybody have any questions for manny or evan or comments I'm curious if you guys are going back to hybrid. I know both of you were distance learners throughout, so. Um, I, I think I've elected to go back to uh, hybrid just for the last try The I don't know, I, just to get that ex senior experience at least a little bit. Yeah, and for me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with distance uh, for a third try. All right. Any other comments or questions? If not, thanks so much for being here again, you guys. We appreciate your updates. Of course, thank you. Yeah, thank always. you. All right, we'll see you guys okay. next meeting then. Take care. Take care. Yes, you too. All right, next on the agenda, we have communications and technology innovation. We have an update on the boundary process from Josh Anderson. Well, good evening, Chair Yenner, directors of the board, Superintendent Tucci Osorio and cabinet. Thank you for this opportunity to bring you another update of our 622 Boundary Committee. Uh, as you know, we are undergoing work right now to change our school boundaries, which will take effect in the fall of 2022. 
Just a review of our timeline. Uh, back in November, you all as a school board approved our guiding principles and committee charge statement for the 622 School Boundary Committee. In December, we accepted applications from community members. In January, you acted upon the membership of our committee members. And then uh, just uh, in early February, uh, we began meeting in our group to start talking about what boundaries could look like for our school again in the fall of 2022. Uh, our board, our, our committee will continue to meet uh, through the end of March um, and even into April if needed, and we'll prepare a final recommendation to send you all as a school board, and we will ask you to take action on a recommended set of school boundaries at your May 2021 uh, business meeting. Again, just as a reminder, our committee charge statement, the committee is developing new school boundaries. Um, the committee will be using the guiding principles, our district mission statement, and the expertise of leadership to provide the foundation of the boundaries. Um, the committee members are expected to strive for boundaries that create the equitable learning environments for all learners that will serve our community now into the future and again efficiently utilize our district resources. And all of our work always comes back to our district mission statement that we will commit each day to develop and empower lifelong learners who thrive in diverse communities. And then again, the guiding principles are the um, statements that we always come back to and ask ourselves um, during our conversations and our boundary work. Uh, we wanna make sure that our new boundaries are, they touch one another. We don't have boundaries that are um, separated geographically. We wanna make sure we're balancing our demographics we want school district boundaries that can last for a while, uh, but may need to change based on housing trends. Uh, we wanna keep the time on a school bus of 30 minutes for our elementary students to the extent possible, keep our walking distances within a half mile when possible, and then we'll, we have processes that we'll work through with open enrolled students and our inter-district transfers. And just a snapshot of the committee timeline. Again, we started a meeting in early February. And then um, we've had three meetings so far. Uh, we will meet again next week, uh, have a week off for spring break, and then come back and try to get things wrapped up here in March and into April. I do wanna let people know that we are posting all of our work on our website. Our website for the Boundary Project is isd622.org front slash boundary project. And here's a snapshot of what it looks like. And so when you go to the main website, on the left-hand side, you'll see a tab that says meeting information. Please click on that tab, and then you'll have a drop-down menu for each of our meetings. And for our meetings, we do post we do post the presentations, we post the video, we do record our sessions, and we post the video. And any handouts that we have, also we have um, there available on the website. So we do encourage people if they're interested uh, to go to our website, um, take a look, and watch videos, look at presentations, look at handouts, because all the information is going to be there on the website. We are committing to a very transparent process for our community. And so um, we do post this information for everyone to see on our website. Again, that website is isd622.org front slash boundary project. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks, Josh. That was a very efficient presentation. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? I just want to make a quick um, observation and, and maybe a follow-up question. Uh, um, I think that beyond tearing down some old buildings and building some brand new buildings and all the remodeling we're doing, the boundary change is probably one of the most significant changes we're going to make to the footprint of our school district. And I'm am really excited and proud of the fact that we want this process to be as inclusive and transparent as possible. Um, so having said that, Josh, just as, as a quick follow-up, do you see any, any additional opportunities that the public could be involved in this process or, or anything that the board can do to encourage the public to be engaged in, and, and help create this new footprint for the district? Steve, thank you for the question. That's a really great question. And the answer is yes. Once we, once our committee has a recommendation, we're going to publish that recommendation and allow for an opportunity for the community to provide, the, to provide feedback on that recommendation before it goes to you all for approval. So yes, there will be additional opportunities for the broad community to have input. Thank you.
All right, anything else? Questions, comments? Uh, if not, thanks for your work on this, Josh, and thanks to the committee. Ah, uh, yeah, Charlotte, go ahead. Yeah, I'm wondering if there is um, anyone that's uh, maybe per perhaps uh, doing outreach to communities that are that are maybe uh, uh, underserved that, that don't even know that this is going on or maybe don't have the language to be able to follow what's happening on uh, the postings, Zoom postings of the meetings that you're having. I'm wondering what kind of outreach is happening. And so I have received questions from our cultural liaisons when they've had questions about our boundary process, they've emailed questions to me and I've given them the answers um, and answers to the questions. And so our cultural liaisons are, are working and will answer questions um, to our community members if there's a language barrier. We certainly wanna make sure that we are providing all the necessary information out to our, to our residents um, in the district. And so I would encourage anyone to reach out to our, our liaisons. They will be in contact with us and we'll provide the information necessary when the questions come in for sure. Thank you very much for that question, Charlotte. That's a great question as well. All right, anything else? Okay. Thanks again, Josh. Um, We'll look forward to your next update. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have Superintendent Tucho Osorio with a few items there. Thank you, Chair Yenner and directors of the board. Um, pleased to share a few items with you this evening. Um, the first item, I'm very pleased to remind the world that this week is School Board Appreciation Week. Um, this week really provides a special opportunity for us to share our appreciation and dedication of our school board members. Um, in public education in Minnesota and as members of our board, you all help to make decisions that have a tremendous impact on our children's future and the quality of life in our community. Long lasting impact, quite frankly, with the work that you do. Um, school board membership is one of the most personally demanding forms of public service. And I think we've all heard from folks who are elected officials in different offices, often say, oh my gosh, a school board member is a really challenging uh, elected office to be a part of. You devote a great deal of time studying education and finance issues and laws and listening to the concerns of our students, parents, staff, and community members. And you really are never off the job. You kind of are committed <laughs> all the time in your work. So um, this group of, of school board members that we have has a combined total of over 51 years of service to District 622. Um, Nancy Livingston has been on our board now for 21 years. Uh, Steve Hunt has been on our board for 12 years. Michelle Yenner has been on our board for 10 years. Caleb Anderson has been on our board for six years. Ben Jarman has been on our board now for two years. And of course we have our two newest board members that we're very pleased to have on our team. Charlotte and Tardy has, is her first year on our school board. And Julia Martins is also on your first year as our school board. Um, what the collective experiences that you all bring. Um, and these are just years that you've been on our school board. Most of you have all been through our district as parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles. And, um, and some have even worked in our school district in the past. So um, we're just really incredibly grateful for all the experience and energy you bring um, and grateful for your public service because this is not an easy job. And I think this pandemic has shown us uh, it's really can be challenging and sometimes in ways you never expected it could be. So um, I just wanna take a moment and thank all of you for your generous gift of time and service to our community. So thank you for all of that and happy school board appreciation week. <laughs> the next item on my agenda, I'm just gonna give a quick mention that um, it is Black History Month, as you all know, and um, there's a couple of things that's important to understand. You know, Black History Month is really an opportunity for us to take time to delve into um, some narratives in, in our history as a country and as a world that don't get enough attention. Um, and this is an opportunity to take uh, time to learn about heroes and um, uh, folks who've come before us who've really led the way, paved the way for, for not only what our country has become today, but what our world has become today. And pave the way for future black leaders who are gonna be growing up in our system to become future 
world influencers themselves. And so um, there's many things going on around the district at different schools along the way, but I just wanted to highlight because two of them are coming up this week. North High has a, a production they've been putting together that's gonna be published online. And um, I know Mari and our communications department is working feverishly right now. I just texted her a little bit to finish the North High production. And I know they were looking at publishing their um, virtual event, which was full of contributions by different um, members of the community uh, for, into a video production that's gonna come out hopefully by tomorrow evening. And Tartan High School has put together an enormous collection of, um, of activities and resources for a virtual event that's gonna take place Thursday evening of this week. So I just wanted to direct people to go check those out in their websites as well, but there's some pretty amazing uh, and engaging activities happening. Uh, the Tartan event does have a ticket sales involved with it and um, proceeds from that sale are gonna go directly toward helping our young people get scholarships to go to historically black colleges and universities. So those HBCUs and promoting that connection for our young folks. So I wanna be sure people check those opportunities out as well um, as we are heading into our last week of February ahead of us right now. Um, next on my agenda is my COVID update. So I'll take a moment and kind of pull that up. Um, I think you heard from a few folks in our public comment that, uh, you know, obviously it seems to be quite a fluid event happening for us. Let me just close this up so I can share my screen and get it right in the right place here for you. Um, as with every uh, school board meeting we've been having of late, we're kind of trying to begin with a, uh, a COVID update each time because so much has been happening. Hang on, sharing my screen here. Um, there we go. So I uh, just wanna give you some updated information and, and um, talk through some things that we're working on right now. Um, as you know, this has been very fluid from the beginning and it feels like every time we think we're, we're solving one problem, a new one pops up and new guidelines come out. And so we're trying to stay on top of all of that. With every one of these presentations, I always like to kind of begin with our current look at our COVID data. As you recall, early on in the process, um, with this COVID crisis, this pandemic, we were given some guidance from the state um, to really look closely at the 14-day case rate per 10,000 people by county. And so this is kind of an update. And, and as you recall, if you look back at previous board presentations I shared with you, uh, I typically share a look at this document every step of the way, just to give you a look at where we're at and where we're heading, where we've been. Um, there's, as you can see, um, the guidance right now, uh, according to this, would be that uh, we would both still be in hybrid, although they changed the guidance around uh, elementary rules so that we no longer have to follow the county level data. They've, they, a while back, and this was announced before winter break, that we are able to bring students back in elementary full in person without the, the extent of social distancing that was required for secondary students. And that being because elementary students, because of their smaller bodies, smaller respiratory systems, tend to be less contagious than our older students are. We uh, often heard from the health department that a student age 11 to 17 is twice as likely to transmit the virus as somebody age 10 and under. Now that's not a hard and fast rule, but a lot of it has to do with size of bodies. And so that's why we were able to bring folks back fully in person at the elementary level ahead of the secondary guidelines. We have a couple other dashboards that we tend to look at. Um, you've seen these from me before. Uh, oops, this one is a dashboard. The, the link is at the bottom of the slide. This is a dashboard put together by a professor at the University of Minnesota. And um, this dashboard takes a look at real-time data. If you recall, the one that the state puts out, it's got a two week lag to it, but that's the official count. This is an unofficial data point. Um, the blue triangles show what the last official data count was according to the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, the black dots are every day's data points. Um, the ones that are ahead of the blue dots though have not yet been verified by the state and, and officially counted. And then the purple uh, figures right there are also looking at um, where they predict the data is gonna go over the next week. So um, as you can see, Ramsey County, the unofficial case right now has dropped to 16 per 10,000 people. And Washington County is dropping to, as dropping to 20 per 10,000 people. Again, this is an unofficial dashboard, but it's one a lot of school districts are looking at because it gives us a little bit more of a real time glimpse than what the one that the, the State Department of Health provides to us because that's got a two week lag. Couple things I wanna just remind everybody about. 
many of the factors that have gone into preparing for returning to school in person, lots of PPE, face, face shields, masks, gloves. You know, at the elementary we've had, to, there's the cohort planning. So how do we keep cohorts of students together um, and try not to cross contaminate between cohorts? Um, our district has installed 1100 classroom air purifiers. These purifiers clean the air in every classroom and they clean, each one of these machines can clean a 750 square feet of space. Um, we have installed touchless drinking fountains. We've installed HVAC upgrades to the highest MERV ratings possible. And I've learned a lot about MERV ratings and filters, but basically those are the, the highest level of filtration that we can possibly have without slowing down and, and inhibiting airflow. So we're having that going on. We know that we have biweekly COVID tests now available for our school staff every two weeks on site. And you got the chance to meet earlier this evening, our lead nurse, Alicia. And um, she's done a phenomenal job of training all of our, um, our school nurses to be helpful in um, administering the, those tests. And she's actually gone so far as to get our, our health uh, staff trained to give the vaccine when and if we're allowed to be able to do so. We purchased um, oh, close to a thousand portable plexiglass shields for places where we need to be able to separate and divide ourselves where we're not possible, we don't, aren't able to do as much social distancing. We've figured out systems when a student goes into quarantine and isn't able to come to class, who can support them through the distance learning model. We've changed all of our bus routes so that we can add 10 minutes between those routes so that we can clean those buses um, between every route and sanitize from for every single seat before between routes, which has had to force us to alter our school start and end times just a little bit right now, at least during this time when we're having to do so much sanitizing. You know that we have a 622 COVID dashboard uh, and I'll just share that with you. Um, hopefully you can see this. I'll try to make my screen a little bigger for you here. Um, this dashboard just gives you a look. These are these numbers are updated every week for the previous week. And so we're trying to put some information in here. You have information about the number of students we have and the number of staff we have, uh, new cases. Um, and by week, we look at, um, you know, which new cases are identified with in-person learners, which ones are athletics and activities and who's been identified in the online learning world as well. Uh, and then obviously close contacts. Close contacts are people that would have been in that real close proximity of those who have been identified as well. And so we've got that information going on as well. And then the total number of students that, have, that we've identified as having uh, gotten COVID versus staff cases as well. So this is a dashboard that's updated every week. So I encourage people to continue to check that information out. Um, and we did, add in the extra layer about in-person versus distance versus athletic. So that's helpful as well. Christine, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so as you know, um, uh, uh, COVID does, uh, does uh, disproportionately affect a lot more people of color than, mm -hmm. uh, than anyone else. Um, mm -hmm. Are you collecting that information and are, are we collecting uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, students of color that are being affected by uh, COVID, their parents passing away because they're, you know, uh, uh, working as a frontline workers and, and, and so forth and so forth. Mm -hmm. Are we collecting that information? And if so, what kind of support are we providing uh, them? Well, every, everybody's classroom teacher and their supports in their building are working with students. We, um, we do not have um, data on students' families and who's gotten COVID and who's, because we don't have a, a way to do that. We do have demographic data about our own students that we are aware of. Um, I don't have that in this report today, but that's certainly something that we can look at. But naturally, as with any student who ever has a family loss, a loss in their family, they're always supported by our counselors, our social workers, and that sort of thing. So that would be the same within COVID times as well. There's many other ser services and supports that we have in place with all of our, our outreach regarding uh, food insecurity and social work services and all of those kinds of things as well. But um, I don't have demographic data on our, on our families, of course, because we don't have really data as to who's, who's gotten COVID. We also, unless a staff member tells us they have COVID, we don't know if they have COVID either. Even with the testing that's happening at the state that's doing testing in our buildings, they don't tell us who tests positive. Um, 
at all. It's kind of up to the employee to tell us if they test positive. So that's their private medical data. So we don't have a way of, of actually knowing who, who, who contracts COVID, at least with the employee group. And of course, with students, we know if they tell us. Does that make sense? Yeah, is, is there a way to be able to co um, collect that information? Because I, I heard that the state is, is uh, starting to collect that uh, demographic information now. Yeah, the state would have the demographic information. You mean as to who's had COVID and who hasn't? Yeah, or who has passed away even, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually, I think that's on our county websites already um, in the counties as far as who has passed away and who has that. So um, I didn't include our county website dashboards here, but I can certainly share those with you. And I've shared them in a previous board update, but I can certainly send those to you. Those do have some demographic information from the county. Um, but again, we don't, as a district, we don't really have a way of, of knowing and collecting that data because it's not data that we're really privy to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Private medical data of families, right? Yeah, for for a school board meeting, it would be nice if we can have demographic information, I guess. So that, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> yes, and I, I completely understand what you're saying. I just have to be honest with you about what's, what's within our, our ability to collect and not. We don't have any data on COVID in students' families because that's not data the school district gets. So um, we can certainly, to the extent that we're able to talk about uh, data, I'd have to check and see what we're even able to do with regard to student data, but we don't collect COVID data. The county collects that. Um, it's not something the school district collects around demographic data and who's had COVID and who's died of COVID. But I can send you the county dashboards for sure. Does that make sense, Charlotte? Okay, good. Just want to be clear about that because I don't want to promise something we don't have access to in that regard. I, you know, I think it also would be helpful for um, uh, uh, those parents that are wondering why the schools are not open and for us to be able to be upfront and, and have all that information out there. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Which, which information are you talking about, Charlotte? Uh, information about uh, uh, the prevalence and who's getting it and who's, uh, you know, while we're making decisions that we're making, um, and, and I completely 100% trust that our healthcare providers, our M MDH is, is uh, providing us with great information, but it'll be nice if we can also uh, have uh, published that information to our parents so that they can see that some of the decisions that we're making are aligned with M MDH guidelines and 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 that, uh, and based on the counties I think we're in Washington County and Ramsey County that this these are in line of what what's happening right now and that's why we're making the decisions that we're making right now. Yeah, and that's why every parent communication we send out, we send the county level data with it. So when we communicate with our families, we always send um, the case rate data, the county level data, and a link to the databases so families can see that at, with our explanation of, of our instructional models. And so we've included those with all of our family updates. Yep. Mm -hmm. Christine, do we know how many of our employees have been vaccinated so far? and? Uh... Do we have an idea of when we would have enough vaccines that every employee who wants a vaccine will have had access to it? If it would be okay, I'd just like to maybe get through the presentation because some of the questions that are coming up, I think will be answered in the presentation itself. Let me buzz through it and I'll come back to you, Caleb. If I don't answer your questions, come back to me on that one, okay? I think it, I think it will help to be able to um, just share what we have here and then we can come back to the questions that you may have afterwards. All right, so, and Charlotte, I can send you previous communications that have gone to um, families. So you see what's been happening with those folks. You'll, you'll be getting those as a board member as well, uh, updates on what we send to families. Um, a couple of pieces of information I wanna just include in here. Um, 
there were some CDC guidelines that came out um, recently on the 17th of, of February, and I've included those for everybody to kind of go back through and take a look at. Um, basically, it talks a lot about mitigation measures um, and the things that are pretty much, we've been asked a lot of times to what extent um, do we uh, look at changing our practices based on the new CDC guidelines. Um, and those have not actually, these are the latest guidelines that have happened. Um, and it basically gives some, some updated reference tools as well. Um, and there's a lot of information in here just for reference. And, and this of course is public record. So this document will go as well, but we've been sharing this with people. Uh, MDE came out with some new planning guidelines as well. And you've all seen this, um, but just for reference, this is all in here as well for clicking through and reading some more information about some of the new guidelines. Um, just basically get back into continuing to reiterate the things that we're supposed to be remembering regarding um, uh, updates for social distancing and things like that. Some of the bigger changes that have come forward from MDH in the last few days. Um, we had a few different pieces that kind of got updated just mid-February. Um, so some things regarding high exer uh, exertion activities that a mask can come off if they're in outdoor settings, um, face coverings. Uh, if it's indoor activity, they have to continue to, oh, I'm sorry, the masks have to stay on during indoor activity um, and cannot be taken off, even during exercise. Um, there's some different kinds of activities in here. Guidance has been updated regarding music and singing and all these things. So there's a lot of different guidance in here, but, but the gist of it is basically that, um, we are continuing to monitor our social distancing guidelines, our hand washing, our so, uh, PPE, and all the same guidelines that are in there as well. So that's kind of stayed the same. Um, again, the county COVID level data, as I continue to reference, and you've seen me reference this in every presentation I've given you this year from way back in the, in the late summer, um, and we'll continue to do that as well along the way. Um, but those are some pieces. The one thing they did say is that, um, you heard me say that earlier in December, the, the state did decide, decide that we no longer needed to use county level COVID data when making decisions about elementary schools. Now there is, uh, they're saying with regard to secondary schools, county level COVID data isn't our only tool of reference, that it's one of our tools of reference. So that's just a, an update that's come out regarding secondary programming. Um, I wanna go back through our timeline of where we've been at and where we're headed. Um, back on January 25th, our K-2 students came back full-time. Now remember, that's the students and families who opted to return because we still had in elementary school, about 30% of our families have chosen to stay in distance learning full-time, even when schools reopened at elementary. We've got some dates coming up. Now you may recall last week, there was a new announcement from the governor um, stating that schools, secondary schools could start to open in a hybrid or in-person model um, as early as this week. And of course, we got that update at the end of last week. And so um, five days notice is not enough time for us to go changing all of our plans. And we've already had to go through our calendar. Part of the governor's previous order says that um, when transitioning between instructional models, people need to be given, teachers need to be given some days off of school for additional preparation and planning. So we had already built the calendar. As you recall, the February 26th was already a day in our regular school calendar. It was an elementary professional development day and grading day, and it was secondary professional development. Um, March 5th was already a day in our calendar for elementary conferences where they meet with the parents, and then secondary was PD and grading. What got added in was March 3rd and 4th, which was two additional days where we're not having school at the secondary level so that our secondary teachers can prepare and get their classrooms ready for the in-person return of students. As you recall, we did that with our elementary students as, or elementary classes as well. We had to cancel some classes so they could have that preparation and planning time. March 8 to 12 was already our spring break and that was already on the calendar, of course, long ago. And so March 15th is our uh, beginning of trimester three and that's the day we're planning to bring secondary students back in hybrid model. Now. The idea of if there were ever a way to, to get our secondary students back earlier, you have to factor in all these days would still have had to have happened. And it really limited our ability to have a smooth return and consider an alternate timeline of any sort. And the governor's order 
with this new announcement last week did say if you already have a plan in place for a return, you can stick with your original timeline, which is good because it would have been really difficult for us to change our timeline. So looking at our current population of students, um, of the students, I mentioned already that in elementary school, about 67% of our students are back full time at elementary and 33% have remained in an online model, learning online. Um, at the middle and high school, now remember, they haven't come back to us yet. So these are just the numbers we've collected so far, the data we've collected. At middle school, it looks like we're going to still have about 42% of families have elected to stay home and keep their children home for online learning um, full time through the end of the through third trimester. And at high school, 54%, so the majority of our students at high school are actually opting to stay at home in that online environment, even when we start to reopen for in-person learning again. So these are some pretty significant numbers. And one thing you've heard me talk about this before, our district is quite different from neighboring school districts. Um, and I think to Charlotte's earlier point, uh, COVID disproportionately affects students of color and indigenous students. And so we are a district with higher diversity um, and higher poverty than our neighboring districts. And so we are significantly higher in the number and percentage of our students that are choosing to stay at home in the online environment. And so um, that's an important data point for us to just keep in mind as we kind of plan ahead. The other thing I wanna talk a little bit about is we are learning that there's a lot of families for whom this works. You know, they want to see some online um, opportunities to continue even when the pandemic is over. And so that's why we're moving forward with, you've heard me talk about how we submitted our application to the Department of Education to get approval for, to be a permanent online provider of online education. And we are moving forward with that. Um, our initial plan was that we were going to work toward having a fully autonomous online high school, um, hopefully with at least pretty well built, even as early as next school year, and then gradually work our way down middle and elementary. But here's what we're learning. All of our neighboring districts are also doing the same thing and they are going K-12 right away next year. So we've had to really rethink our, our uh, model. We know that we want our students to have an opportunity in our district to stay in our district and not have to go somewhere else if this is the kind of learning model they want and prefer. And so we need to ramp up our opportunities so that we're meeting the needs of our community. We already know that before the pandemic, we had well over 200 students, this is before COVID, who were open, who were already enrolled in an online charter school somewhere in our state, but live in District 622. We also know that we have right now over 200 students who are um, homeschooled. They live in our district boundaries. There are students by, by geography, but they are being homeschooled. We believe that by offering an online learning model for our students, and by the way, they're in all grades, K through 12, um, we believe that by offering a stronger and more robust online program permanently, we might give a better opportunity for our families to stay connected to our local district and not have to enroll in programs that are based in other cities around the state. And um, that way also a student or a family that's enrolled in this kind of a program would be able to tap into and be a part of our extracurricular activities or athletics, things like that, because they are 622 students. So that's another benefit for families. We want them to feel connected to our community, but we also want to meet the different learning needs that are out there for our families. A couple of topics I'd like to talk about. The question has come up a little bit about secondary grading. Um, I know we've had some questions about that. And I'll tell you, this is we are not unique in this, but we've been really holding ourselves to some standards, collaborating a lot with our neighboring districts as well about this. But um, one of the concerns we had about secondary grading was this model, um, not only is it new for our students, but it's new for our teachers to teach in this kind of environment this past year. So what we've tried to do is our schools have not been issuing failing grades for high, students in a hybrid or distance model. Um, and this is per the guidance from the Department of Education. Instead, what we're doing is we're holding students harmless to some degree. Um, we still contact, we work with students on grade percentages and they still are getting letter grades. But for example, if somebody gets a D in a class, we're working with that student, with that family to convert that D um, to either a P as a pass, or if they were gonna earn an F, 
just as a no grade. So rather than getting an F on their transcript, which would then calculate into their GPA, if they didn't earn the credit, then they need to take the class and earn the credit, but that GPA isn't weighted down by, uh, by that F. So we're trying to make sure that doesn't hold students back during a time of such transition. And, and quite frankly, trauma. We, you know, we all don't know what's going on for everybody and the mental health of everybody is really affected during this time. So we're really kind of working on that to hold people um, harmless to the extent that if they need to repeat the class, they can repeat it, but not holding their grades harmless and their GPA harm, or not, not, um, not ruining their GPA over a time when this is such an unusual time to be in school. Um, social distancing has come up a lot. How are we gonna social distance secondary programs in high school and middle school? Well, here's a couple of things. Meals at the secondary schools are gonna to have to happen in classrooms because we just can't put 1600 kids or half of that into a, a cafeteria together. So there's a lot of distancing. We're setting up a lot of one-way hallways where there's not students passing each other, staggering dismissal between classes. And instead of going to six classes in a day, our kids will go to three, three longer classes. So they have fewer transitions in the hallway, fewer opportunities to mix and mingle. Uh, the questions come up for interventions for struggling learners. So in our secondary schools, I just collected some data. Remember how I told you all year long, we've been bringing some students, groups of students in who are struggling learners, whether they be students on IEP, special education, or students learning English, but also just students who are failing a class. We, um, I just calculated the numbers yesterday. We have had 496 secondary students who regularly, not a one time, have regularly been catching a bus and coming to school throughout the fall and winter for regular in-person instruction, in a, even when we've been in distance learning. So nearly 500 students of our secondary learners have had that uh, opportunity, have been brought in because they needed some in-person support. So even though we've been in distance learning, we've had many students who've been riding buses, getting to school, being fed a hot meal and having supports in person. So that's our latest numbers. Um, a couple other pieces. People have been asking about prom and graduation. So um, we are very much working toward having both of those. Um, the prom, we are working, each school is working on a different plan, I believe. Um, Tartan already had their prom set up to exist and take place at the Mall of America. Um, and that's a unique prom. My daughter had a prom at Tartan when she was a student at Tartan at the Mall of America. And they have their dance, but then when Nickelodeon Universe closes down, the students in their prom attire all get to ride the rides and they're the only group using those those ride or on those rides at that time. So the Mall of America has its own system set up for how they are socially distanced people and what their guidelines are and how many people can be in a space and what have you. Um, I believe last I checked and I'd have to double check North was still finalizing where their prom plan at this point, um, but they were also working on a prom going forward with a prom. We know we wanna have the Grand March so people can have that opportunity to have that experience. Graduation, as I've told you, um, we are very much moving forward with in-person graduation planning. Right now, um, it's looking more and more like our graduations will take place on our football fields, um, which means we're gonna have a graduation date and a rain date because if it rains, obviously we have to pick a different date. Now, because we have artificial turf, um, I've learned that we cannot put folding chairs out on that field without damaging the turf. So Randy's working on getting some sort of protection for the turf so that we can put chairs out there and what have you. One of the key things we're waiting for though is guidance from the governor's office around numbers. Right now, the limit, even in an outdoor venue is 250 people. As you know, um, our graduating classes have between 375 to 450 kids in them. So if we have a North High graduating class of 450, uh, 250 is not going to allow us to have everybody there at the same time and certainly not going to allow those students to bring any parents with them. So if that is still the case that we have to go with that number, then we will have to have our, our graduation ceremonies in shifts and not everybody at once, even if it's an outdoor venue. Um, but we are hopeful that that guidance will change by the time we get around to actual having our, our graduation ceremonies. But I think it's pretty safe to say um, we are not expecting that we're going to be able to do our, our graduation ceremonies in at Aldrich Arena like we normally do um, because it's an indoor venue and we don't believe it would be pretty uh, surprising if there was an allowable, uh, uh, we were ever allowed to have that many people, you know, a couple thousand people in an indoor venue at this time. So we're not expecting it's going to be indoor, but we are definitely working for an in-person graduation. And we put that message out to our families 
and that we are likely looking at outdoor graduation ceremonies as well. But we'll keep you posted on that. Now to the Minnesota State High School League recommendation. Um, you heard some families who came forward today to talk about some concerns about that recommendation. Here's, here's basically the conundrum and the challenge with that. As you heard, this announcement just came out at the very end of last week and we'd already kind of planned our agenda for tonight. But we always expect that there's gonna be some new, new things we have to consider in, in what we look at and how we consider our planning. Um, but I'll tell you that the big issue with regard to the Minnesota State High School League guidelines, we have gotten many different messages from the Department of Education, the Department of Health and the Minnesota State High School League. So yes, the Minnesota State High School League did just come out with some recommendations that allow for a shortened quarantining period for students if certain conditions exist. Here's the challenge though. Even with that, even if we were to shorten the quarantining period, we have gotten separately, not in a public document, an email from our guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health. And we have the email to show it that says, even if someone had a shortened quarantine, um, they would still have to be monitoring for symptoms and could not be near within six feet of anybody else for 14, full 14 days, which means they couldn't play in a game. Um, if they were at practice sooner than that, they'd have to be far away from the other kids and they couldn't be close to them. So part of the issue, um, we're trying to get some clarification around that because you heard some families tonight saying, we need to shorten the quarantine period so our kids can have more opportunities for games. The problem is um, Minnesota State High School League put out this recommendation for a shortened period but the health department has told us something different and we have it in writing and it's it's been confusing. We've been trying to get some answers to that. So um, the other issue that comes with the, the Minnesota State High School League recommendation is that it doesn't match up with um, the health department and the CDC guidelines for in general secondary students. And so if we were to shorten the quarantine for athletics, at this point, we would essentially have a shorter quarantine kind of a looser standard for quarantine and COVID rules with athletics than we do in our own classrooms. And that's kind of the conundrum we're facing. Um, so as a board, yes. I think there's some confusion though, because the Minnesota State High School League actually links out to the Minnesota Department of Health clarification. It's not a Minnesota State High School League clarification. Instead, Minnesota State High School League links out to the clarification from Minnesota Department of Health and Minnesota Department of Health is providing the opportunity for this, you know, I don't know what they call it. But anyway, a seven day quarantine. So, and I know that's brand new as of the 19th, but I do think that, you know, I have a lot of empathy for those families who are being quarantined in a way that isn't consistent with how other schools are quarantined. Mm -hmm. No, and, and, and I'm just saying, I'm just saying we have not even made a decision on it because when we talked to the Department of Health, we got a different answer. And that's, that's all I'm saying. And that's why there hasn't been a change in our guidance because when we talked to our own people at the Department of Health, we got something different back from them. And that's, I'm just saying, we're just trying to get clarification on that. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just okay, but the document is clear. And if you got some other information that says something else, I do feel like we need to give those families that answer because obviously, no, for we sure, all know, for sure. If you have kids sitting in quarantine that want to be on the ice, that they need to answer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we can come back to that. Um, but I just wanted you to understand why we hadn't made a change to our plans yet, because this just came out at the end of last week and we had some very different messaging from our own contact at the Minnesota Department of Health. And that's kind of where the conundrum landed for us. So, um, and that is, we've been given a different recommendation. Um, there is an option, yes, to shorten it. But when we've talked to our health people about, okay, should we, they say, no, don't. So I, I get that they have that in writing, that it's an option to do so. And so I guess that'll be a conversation for you as a board to decide um, if you feel that's where we're When at. would we have that conversation though? We can have it right now if that's what you would like to have. I would just like to, uh, we didn't set up a whole conversation tonight just about this, but we certainly um, could do that. 
Um, I, I also just want to add, um, if, if I could just, um, so in the news, I've been following the news and, and their uh, parents and students that, that throughout the state that have been uh, complaining about uh, wearing masks are uh, a health hazard for them. I, I, I've seen it in the news. Have we had any uh, individuals uh, complaining about that? Because I, you know, I, like I said, I personally follow health guidelines from Minnesota um, uh, Department of Health, but I, I'm just wondering if that's an issue in our own school district. And if so, uh, that has not been an issue for us. Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll just be honest. The, the topic that this all came to, my explanation for you tonight is why we hadn't done any changes to our plan yet, because we are still talking to our neighboring, our neighboring districts haven't all changed their quarantine plans yet. And we're trying to figure out what everybody's gonna be doing. We have a big Metro wide meeting this week and we're trying to figure all those pieces out. Um, and we had not put that as an agenda, like that was not something that was even on our radar that this was a big, huge issue until obviously an hour before this meeting tonight. So mm -hmm. that's where we're yeah, I don't at. think that the board prepared to weigh in on it because, you know, we don't have doc, you know, we haven't reviewed the policy and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I guess I would just ask that for the sake of the, you know, Taha, the hockey folks that are interested in the answer that we give them some sort of mm -hmm. timeline for when they can. No, we, we have to figure this out in the next couple of days. But I'll tell you, the one thing we're trying to do is get some data from our neighboring folks and talk to our regional support teams, just because I'm telling you when we've been given different messages. But no, it will be in the next couple of days for sure. But that's kind of the issue that we're facing right now is just that we've been given a couple of different messages in writing that are very different. So. And that's kind of what we're trying to kind of uh, unpack as well. Um, but I'm all for absolutely getting something out there to everybody this, like in the next day or two, just figuring out what our, where we're going to go with all this for sure. Um, and if our thought is we want to take the more lenient approach, you know, that's something that we can do, but I wouldn't want to do it for athletics and not in our classroom environments. Because athletics is where we've been having the cases, not in the classrooms. The guidance is specific to athletics and not to classrooms. So I'm not sure that making a decision for athletics requires us to make the same decision for the classroom. No, 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 but, but no, but this is the issue that we've discussed in our health office here is that to have less looser standards in athletics than in our classrooms when athletics is where the cases have been coming to us from. That's all. Well, and the Minnesota High School League has every vested interest in getting kids back into athletics as quickly as possible. And the league is very um, subjective to uh, active parents who want to see their, their kids back in athletics as quick as possible. The high school league does not supersede the Department of Health's recommendations. They're just placing us in a position of of trying to figure out a way to uh, provide us with a little cover if we decide to send the kids mm -hmm. um, back early. I do think it is uh, a little bit of, di of a disparate lens to look at athletics as different than in class because I could imagine 150 parents contacting us next week saying you let the kids play on ice with a seven day quarantine. Why can't we send our kids back to school? Mm -hmm. So I think it is important that we, we manage both. But remember as a board, we voted a, a few months ago to give the chair and the superintendent the authority to manage our COVID mm -hmm. response. And so I would just remind the board that we have approved a process for a change to be made mm -hmm if the chair and the superintendent determine that a change is, is appropriate at this time. 
Yeah. And so that's certainly an option that we can work through. I just want to make, and we could do that, you know, with just Michelle and I and, and our, our lead folks who are looking at this data with the, with the team as early as tomorrow. I just, I just want to be clear that um, to change our quarantine guidelines without having a little bit clarity, better clarity from the Department of Health was what we were trying to figure out. And to decide if we were going to have a separate standard for academics versus athletics. I also just want to clarify, though, that this is not guidance from Minnesota State High School League. This is guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health. Minnesota State High School League links to it, but this is Department of Health guidance. And I'm just telling you, we got different guidance from the Department of Health. But I hear you. I hear you. We also have documents from the CDC guidelines in the health department that say six feet of social distancing. And we've also been told that even if we shorten the quarantine, they still can't play in a game because they still have to be six feet apart from other people for the 14 days. And that's what we're trying to get better clarification around. Okay, I guess I would just ask that the cabinet review the guidance from Minnesota Department of Health that they issued on the 19th and then give a decision to Taha and that and I guess the rest of our sports teams. No, 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 for sure. No, well, and I, and I really did want to hear from you all tonight if you're comfortable having a different set of standards for athletics and academics in that regard. And the other thing is we're learning um, the state gives us all kinds of guidelines and then people kind of do what they want anyway. That's what's been happening quite a bit, which makes this whole job really difficult right now. Um, because the, even the new, this is why it's challenging because it just came out, but the new Minnesota State High School League rules, yes, there's still this ability um, to shorten the quarantine, but they're still telling us they can't play in a game. This is my whole point though. There's there's conflicting information and we're trying to get it clarified right now. But I'm totally fine. I mean, we're totally fine shortening it. I just want to make sure we're doing it in a way that is also morally right. Yeah, too if if the if the um if the athletic league is just linking to a page um in the Department of Health and like Christina's saying, the information that we're getting is very fluid. It's changing all the time. How do we know that the high school league has the correct link that we're go that that they're pointing everybody to? And that's why I think the extra steps that Christine's taking to verify with the correct with the correct people to make sure that's correct because it sounds pretty contradictory to me. Well, and here's the thing, the Minnesota Department of Health and what Michelle's referencing, yes, they do reference the Department of Health, but the Department of Health says you can have a shortened quarantine, but 14 days is still recommended. Even the Department of Health guidance still says that. It's still the recommended course of action and it's up to each district to decide. And that's, that's the hardest part because we're trying to figure out, okay, how does that compare to what our neighbors are gonna be doing? Because if we're all gonna be competing against each other and because if we have, if you know, because the health department guideline does still say it's still recommended to have a 14 day quarantine, even with athletics, but we can go shorter if we want to, but that's on us as a district if we decide to do so. And that's, that's the hardest thing about all this is that it's, it's been really fluid and we're trying to get a sense of what everybody else is going to do right now so that we can all be on the same page. So, Christine. Mm -hmm. Having worked with you these last couple months, I've learned that you do communicate with other uh, school districts ar around. Uh, do you have, can you gauge what they're going to do? Because you do communicate with them and, and, and maybe help guide us on what yes. we should. Oh, absolutely. And I'll have a better sense in another day or two because they're all in the middle of these same discussions right now. And they're all dealing with the fact that do we have a different set of rules now for um, athletics than we do for um, uh, academics? And they're all wrestling with that question right now because the guidance says you can shorten it, but we still recommend you don't. And do we then just do it for athletics and not for academics? And that's what people are wrestling with right now. But I will tell you every week when we meet as a metro area group of superintendents, we, we throw some poll questions in and we all answer the polls live in the Zoom to get a sense of what everybody's decided to do. And these will be a big part of our discussion this week too. 
So what kind of guidance can you give us as school board members on how to move forward? My best advice would be give me a day or two and then let's, we'll bring back a recommendation for you. And if need be, let me work with Michelle as your leader of your board that you've designated to finalize that recommendation. That would be my best advice. If you wanna choose a different course of action though, you are the board and you can certainly do so. Well, again, I just wanted to remind the board that we did vote to uh, give the superintendent and the chair the ability to to develop our COVID response and to change it as needed. Um, and I don't think uh, those parameters have changed a whole lot since last fall. The fact of the matter still is, is that there's some conflicting information depending on the lens through which you look at it. And the situation is very fluid. Okay. And if athletics is going to be successful, everyone who's who's on the ice at the same time should be playing with the same information and the and the same rules. I, I'm perfectly fine with leaving a final decision, whatever it is, up to the superintendent and the chair. I, I was not around at the time when it was decided. But I do agree that I think that Michelle and uh, Christine should be able to decide and not involve the rest of us in uh, making the nitty gritty decisions about whatever. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree. Every time we've had other th guidances come out around athletics, we've always just gone, we, get, we talk with all our neighbors and we all go together and do the same thing as our neighbors do. And that's typically what we've done in the past. I don't see this being dramatically different uh, in that regard, but I just wanted you to understand some of the uh, challenges we're kind of trying to wrestle with. And that's what some of our neighbors are wrestling with as well. And that's why we're trying to um, do a little groundwork before we finalize a change in practice right now. Um, that's all. So here's my comment. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> we're elected people, we're, from all walks of life, right? We are not epidemiologists. This kind, this discussion kind of reminds me of what's happening at the state level, because you know the Senate, Minnesota Senate, state Senate is wrestling with this idea of: do we rely on the governor to weigh in about the opening and closing of schools, or do we all leave it up to local control? I mean, local control is a fine idea, and and of course, you know. We are the independent school district, but again, we're teachers, and I don't know what I am. <laughs> um, reporter, and, Nancy. And, Come on. Um, professionals of various kinds. We're, we're not. We are not experts, and mm. um, and we rely on the advice of experts. I mean, the governor is surrounded by PhDs and experts, so I'm comfortable with with you know, relying on the advice of experts, you know, listening, of course, to our, 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 our moms and dads and families. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, we need to make the best decision for, for the majority, you know, for uh, of, our, of our students. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I think your idea, Christine, about, you know, uh, coordinating with our neighbors, you know, hashing it out a little more with Michelle and taking a couple more days, you know, uh, makes sense before mm -hmm. we jump to a decision um, and put it out to, to uh, the parents and so on. And, and honestly, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't have a super strong opinion on, I just want to make sure that we do this right. Because, you know, even, even the Minnesota State High School League news that came out, when you click on their link to MDH, it's still, the first line is basically, or the first paragraph is still, we still recommend 14 days. Okay, so let's just make sure we're clear what all of our neighboring people are doing because we're going to be playing against them and we don't want to have ourselves doing something dramatically different than the rest. That's all. Um, my uh, comment is that if, if you find that MDE is not explicitly against a shorter quarantine and if, if we're not the uh, only school district in the area that would be having a shorter uh, quarantine time, then I'm fine with uh, temporarily having different guidelines for our sports uh, teams than versus our academics. 
Okay. I just know there was some a lot of discussion today about there's a lot of nuances to this that we have to make sure we're thinking this through and let's make sure we're in connection with our neighbors on how everybody's doing this. But I don't foresee it being a huge, I mean, if that's the direction we're gonna go, it's the direction we're gonna go and we may just have more people getting shut down. But, um, you know, our, I know our team has connected with our athletic directors and their thought was at least one of the reflections was that it's not a huge difference if you can't play in a game anyway until 14 days. Um, that it's not a huge difference to be able to make that change or not make the change because the guidance, at least we've been given, also says you still can't play in a game for 14 days because you can't be within six feet of somebody else. But that's the part where we're trying to get clarified that everyone else is hearing the same message we are. Like you're saying too, I, I go back to that point you're making about um, our 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 the cases that we're having in the district are sports related. Um, if we're trying to make, if if we're looking at making um, our guidance our guidelines in sports a little bit more lenient, that sort of scares me. Um, just for the fact that uh, there's the there's going to be a chance that um, there's going to be more of an infection rate. And how can you, how can you uh, then invite or have, have our students come back to school then with some of them playing sports at the same time um, in the classroom? It seems like there's going to be a, a mixture that's not quite what we want to see. That number just the the fact ultimately the fact that we're having out, uh, outbreaks in sports is is, is kind of critical to me. That's been the conversation among superintendents, just trying to figure out how to reconcile that. Shelly, do you have a comment? Yeah, I just want to add uh, one comment that's not to you all, but to. Uh, maybe athletic directors and coaches that have to mitigate all these issues. Oh my goodness. I've, mm -hmm. I've had kids uh, in sports and all that, and I cannot even begin to imagine what kind of uh, issues they're going through right now to be able to even uh, uh, be able to function as as uh, athletic directors and and coaches. So mm -hmm. just want to thank them for hanging in there and uh, doing what they can to um, uh, keep the uh, school district going. Because we, after this whole COVID thing um, is done, we're we're going to be 622 strong and and we're we're going to to be there so i i i just want to applaud them for doing what they're doing because it's mm -hmm. not, not I, easy i have to I'm deal sure. with them because my kids were in sports and 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 so yeah i just want to do i i i, I wanted to say that mm -hmm. i hear you Okay, um, Christine, you, were you finished with the COVID report, the COVID update? No, you still have. No, I just had one slide left. If you wanna talk about vaccines. <laughs> um, a question came up earlier, I think it was Caleb who talked about, so what are the numbers on the vaccines? Um, here's the issue, and it kind of comes back a little bit to the positive test results. Uh, the state doesn't tell us who's gotten a vaccine. Um, we have, received allocations, we've rolled, sent those emails out to staff to sign up. We found out that many did not get in. So all we have to go off of is our own survey of staff to ask them if you are willing to share with us whether you've had a vaccine or not, which they have no obligation to tell us. If you're willing to tell us, would you please do so? And if so, please list your name here so we know not to add you to a future list. Um, but what we're looking at is um, at least of those who've reported it to us in the low to mid 300s. Um, 
out of 1,700 employees. So there's a state program, as you know, we put together a very thoughtful um, vaccine prioritization list. I've shared that with you previously. Um, the state, once they took over our program, they abandoned our prioritization list and it's, I guess it's sort of a lottery system now. Counties um, are adding vaccines around the whole state. They're, they're, once they get through some of their vaccine programs, the 1A group, they are then able to move on to vaccinations for uh, school staff. Um, there are counties in the area that have vaccinated entire school districts. Um, one of my concerns and challenges is this past week is that I, I've expressed concern to both of our counties that I don't wanna be last on both of their lists because we are split between two counties, Washington and Ramsey. And I've had a lot of conversations with folks to make sure people understand that we are um, among, other than St. Paul Public Schools in all of Washington County and Ramsey County, we are the highest poverty, most diverse school district. And I sure hope we don't get left to last. Um, and I do know that there's been you know, some inequities in how that's all been, um, uh, that we're supposed to be able to, um, you know, change our communication or we, should we be giving them different numbers? Should we be finding things out? And we're finding out that there's just been a lot of disconnect in terms of who's been getting vaccinations from their counties and who has not. We, uh, up until this week had not gotten any, um, any questions from any communication from Washington County for any vaccines at all. Um, we finally got our first communication from them yesterday after we had a lot of phone calls last week. Um, Ramsey County has sent us um, a some doses here and there when they've had a few here and there. We've also had the opportunity, we're starting to, hopefully we're gonna start to hear from some private clinics as they end up with a few extra doses. As you know, if a dose gets thought out, um, you know, then it has to be distributed that day. And if they have people who are supposed to come for appointments and they don't come in for appointments, um, that, um, that that will, um, they'll call us and let us know if, even if they have four doses or five doses or seven doses. And we want to know that as well. So we're managing multiple lists right now. Um, but again, it's a, it's a guessing game as to who's actually been vaccinated and who hasn't because the state does not tell us that information and our own employees don't have to tell us if they don't want to. So, oh, did I forget, was I not sharing my screen? Sorry, that was my last slide anyway. Um. Can, I, can I add to the, just one brief add? Uh, my worst nightmare has been that uh, Kim, bless Kim, she's so good at communicating with us. Mm -hmm. she, to send me an email and say, hey, board, do you want to get together in person or not? And then I'm going to be the one that's saying, oh, I guess probably in August or, or, you know, or September that guess what? I haven't gotten my shot yet. And, and so I, I really don't want to come in in person. And, and so I, yeah, I, I hope that, um, I, yeah, Kim, if that happens, I hope you can forgive me, but you know, I'm, I'm just saying that th this whole thing has been haphazard and everything and, and, uh, um, and, and I, I just don't want to get together in person if I haven't gotten the vaccine and knowing that I could be uh, at risk or anything. So I'm, I'm just saying. I agree wholeheartedly. And we're trying to really work our way through that. And of course, as a school district employee, as a member of our board, you're a member of our group when we finally get our way through that. By the way, I just sent a follow-up check to see if any of our neighboring superintendents have made any decisions about shortened quarantines. And I'll just say uh, three of our closest neighbors have not yet made any changes to their quarantine rules, despite Minnesota State's high school league. They're still discussing. You know I, don't, I wouldn't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but my kids did play volleyball in the fall. And what happens in our district or in our conference is some of the schools follow the guidance from MDE and from Minnesota Department of Education and some don't. Because as you know, there's a lot of 
different schools in our conference. So some of these parents now with Taha are saying, well, these other schools are doing something completely different and they have been all along. You know, if you think about the public, the private schools in our private district. Schools have, private schools have not followed the same guidance we have for sure. Yeah, and so then it's so frustrating for families who want their kids to, you know, participate in these things that were being held to different um, rules. And, and we're I being held to the public school standards. Right, right, right. I, I do believe in following the guidance. I just think we got to look at the adjustments when the guidance is adjusted. No, and I get it. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion. Families have also all along had concerns that we that private schools don't follow the same public school rules. And that's not, I mean, that's been true since the beginning of this pandemic for sure. And and there's not always a clear understanding that private schools do have some different leeway and they don't meet with the regional support teams like we do. They don't get the same people guiding their decision-making and they don't get funding in the same way we do and whatnot, but I hear you. But anyway, I just want you to know, like, cause I did just send a follow-up text when we started chatting earlier this evening, like, hey, has anybody, Gone to, and they're all in the process we're in right now of debating and looking at it to see, is this something we're gonna make that change or not? But again, our immediate neighboring districts aren't necessarily the people we play in the conference either. I, I just wanna make it clear. It's not like 62 is sitting here going, oh, everybody else has decided we're gonna change our whole quarantine guidelines. Uh, and 62 is the only one that hasn't, uh, most haven't done anything to change their stuff yet. So. I'm just saying that because this is a new guidance that people are all debating and discussing it right now before they make any big changes to the rules. And that's all. Um, just a comment, not, not about the quarantine guidelines, but <laughs> just about vaccination in general. <clears throat> I think anxiety has always been high, but I think it's growing now as people uh, here, oh, you know, your neighbor's brother-in-law got a, a shot, you know, your next door neighbor, got, you, you, you know, I just got a text from my, my oldest daughter who texted me proudly her, the fact that she was vaccinated. Uh, she happens to work in a, in a St. Paul school. Um, but I mean, it just, and then I got a call today from a, a, one of my best friends, you know, go to hy V, get, you know, go online with hy V. No, they're, they're, I mean, the pressure <laughs> is growing and it just seems so kind of random and crazy uh, relative to, you know, because every time I check, there's nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Nancy, but, uh, Nancy, I just want to add that all these people are younger than you are. Yeah, they're all younger than me, I know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Whatever I don't know. I, I I'm just saying. Well, we're, we're if we had been if we'd been time. allowed to use our our priority list that we created in the beginning, that wouldn't be quite the same thing. But we don't get to use it anymore. So. No, no. So it. Uh, what can I say? <laughs> no, I know. And then it's been rough. And then, on top of it all, I got a call today from a former. Minnesota state senator who told me <clears throat> that he, about he's a long hauler. He got COVID and he was, and he's younger than me and he was in regions for weeks and weeks and they're putting steroids in one arm and, and, uh, and then he got diabetes because when you use all those steroids, you get diabetes and then they're, they're putting insulin in another arm. I mean, this is really serious when you do get it. Okay. It's very, very serious. Mm -hmm. um this mm -hmm. is not a joke you know this is very serious stuff um so we're uh, you know safety first we're doing the best we can we want to keep our kids alive and well uh we want to give them opportunity we're balancing all these things so anyway all right anything else on covid before i move to policy 610 <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about academics for a minute. Um, you showed the numbers before um, for secondary. It looks like 50% for, uh, for middle school, it's 50% or 58% in person, 42% online. And then for high school, it's kind of flipped. So high school is 46% in person 
and 54% online, which, you know, I, I know you probably didn't get feedback from every family, but it seems kind of split right down the middle. Um, we know that, you know, if you're a hybrid student, you'll be going in and you'll get direct face-to-face -face instruction with your teachers. Um, for secondary, that's about half of our students, at least those that came in. Um, so that leaves the other half um, that'll be distance. And I'm, I'm not even like, I'm going to assume also that if you're, uh, if you're a Monday, Tuesday kid or student, uh, on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, well, let's just stick with Wednesday and, and Thursday, you'll be um, also in a distance scenario. Uh, for the last couple of days, I've, uh, I always listen in on my kids' Zoom meetings because they're actually pretty good. I learned some stuff in them. Um, but today I was kind of like taking notes um, on what the teachers were saying about their um, plans for trimester three and what it would look like for kids that are, you know, coming in on Mondays and Tuesdays or Wednesdays and Thursdays and what it would look like, you know, if you're home, um, you know, whether it's like for three days you're at home or if you're home for five days, whatever it may be. And I was just kind of taking down some notes and, um, and I noticed like one teacher is going to like live stream, which is cool. And another teacher is going to like record something like a little video um, and post it to uh, Schoology, which is cool too. Um, there's a lot of options out there and I think teachers are making the best of it. Um, I guess the first thing I'll mention is I know there's no requirement that our teachers um, have to do both distance and hybrid at the same time you know, obviously because it's really, really, really hard. Um, but our teachers are stepping up from what I'm hearing, from what I've been hearing on the Zoom calls, that they're going to have options out there, really good options to be able to touch those kids in hybrid and the kids in distance. Um, they're going to stretch themselves to make that happen. And that's a real testament to what our teachers are doing. Um, based on the, the fact that I, I've I've been hearing and still not really sure if it's true, but they don't have to do that. So that's a really big deal to me that they're stepping up for our kids um, and stretching themselves to work with both scenarios. Um, and nobody wants to do hybrid, but that's, that's kind of the situation with um, staffing and uh, six feet of distance. That's just what it's all about. Um, I'm wondering, number one, if you're, if, if it's been any kind of an issue with teachers um, to kind of help them do both, um, or if there's been any pushback in that general area. And then the other thing I was thinking too, and maybe this is more of a principal level thing, but um, I was taking all these notes for each teacher that my son has, how they're gonna handle distance learning um, in, th in the last trimester. And I was like, oh, it'd be kind of cool if like you could just get a list per school showing, you know, here's teacher A, she's going to be, she's going to be giving her distance lessons with a pre-recorded video. And here's teacher B, he's going to be um, live streaming. Um, so then it's just a one shop sh stop shop. And I know this information will be pretty clear for the kids in Schoology, I would hope. Um, but as a parent, I'd, I'd kind of like to know, you know, instead of digging through Schoology, or relying on my on my son to kind of tell me how that's working. If there'd be just like a general way I could see what what a teacher just how they plan to deliver um, their distance lessons. I went on there, but I really think academics is like, you know, that's what we're all about. And I kind of I'm curious about how this transition is going to work um, as we go back to hybrid. It's a big deal to me, and I, I kind of want to see where we're going with that. Well, you bring up a good point. Per the governor's order, we're not allowed to ask a teacher to do both, live stream and teach in person. It's literally forbidden. We're not allowed to do that. Um, so, um, which is tricky because it's one thing if you're a district that has 10% of your kids in distance learning, but we have, as you can see, 40, 50 plus percent of our kids in distance learning. And so when our teachers are in person, um, 
the big question, the million dollar question. And this is part of why, especially in 622, we had a hard time doing hybrid in the fall because of the numbers, large numbers of students that were still choosing to stay in distance learning. And it hasn't really changed a lot. Um, but but data has, the, the COVID data has dropped significantly. Um, and as long as we're required to do both options, um, we're gonna always probably run into this challenge right now. And so what we're doing, um, every principal is working with their staff to figure out what their options are gonna be. The options are you can live stream your class um, with the kids in front of you and the kids at home. You can on your Fridays, which is the day that's in asynchronous, you don't have a group in front of you, that day do your videos and push them out for the following week. Or at the end of each day, record yourself giving the, the key lesson. And at the end of each day, push those out to your students who are at home. So there's basically three core options our teachers are being given. Um, as far as every, every principal is going to, there's gonna be communication regarding how your child's teachers are gonna be working with you and your cl their classes. Um, we will probably not be giving you a list as a board of every teacher in the district and what they chose to do or not do because the union would absolutely balk at that because it's not something that's being required of people to actually, but I think that's not what you're asking, Ben. I think you're asking that you wanna know for your child, how is it gonna work for each of their teachers? And that we're being really clear. And every one of our principals has got a list going of what each teacher is gonna choose as their optional way of delivering to the kids at home. And you will definitely be getting communication about that. for. For your child's teachers, you're going to definitely be doing a, a, a communication about who's doing what and, and in your classes, what that's going to look like. We're making sure that every teacher who needs an extra camera or who needs extra, we're even giving roaming microphones where we can to staff teachers in different rooms because if they are going to live stream to kids at home, so we're trying to make sure they have all the tech they need. It's they need. huge. Yeah, it is huge. It's a real big challenge. Christine. And from my perspective, I really want to see the district data uh, of what Ben is talking about, not just one school, but the district data, what's happening as far as access to um, exactly what he's talking about. You want to know how many Aggreg teachers are like Aggregated data. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about every student. I'm, I'm just talking about aggregated data. Right, of how many teachers are live streaming and how many are pushing out videos? And, and, and no, also demographics because- uh, Of the teachers? Uh, no, students that are accessing it, what he's talking about. He's talking about- Charlie. Which teachers are going to live stream and which teachers are going to push out videos? That's, yeah, he, that's what he's talking and about. And what stu which students are accessing what students are providing? Charlotte, are you interested? My concern, in my concern is uh, about uh, the uh, that uh, students of color. Um, are getting more behind during these times. And so I, that's really all, um, I, I, yeah. So it, I just want to be clear, if, if, if a teacher live streams their lesson, if they live stream their lesson or they push out their lessons in video format, I, I don't know that either one of those would cause a student to be behind. It's just a different delivery model. So it's a question of each child knowing what their teacher's plans are. If you wanna know how many students are failing a class or how many are failing, I mean, I guess I wanna think about how to, I, I, our demographic data about how many kids have failed classes or how many kids are, um, because a teacher, who, a teacher who pushes out videos or a teacher who live streams while teaching in another group doesn't necessarily influence whether good or bad, it's, it's really gonna boil down to whether the teacher's got effective strategies for, for supporting learners, right? Sure. What, what Ben is talking about. I think it I really boils down to who is even showing up and participating in what the school district has to offer. Okay, so attendance data. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really all I'm talking about. Yeah, sure. Attendance data, achievement data, all of those are data points with regard to students. Charlotte, I wonder if the data around the learner or students in online versus 
um, hybrid learning would be helpful. Is that the question you're asking or no? That's a step towards it, yes, yes. That, that'll be good. Michelle, do you have the data? I do not. But demographic data around learner or students in online versus hybrid would be interesting to, I think, the full board. We have, we have that data. I can send that to you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else on COVID? All right, um, I think the next item on the agenda is revision of policy 610 field trips. Okay, so the revision of our field trip policy, this is not, uh, this is just a, a formal reading of our policy. This is a proposed change to our policy. Um, we already have a field trip policy and a field trip policy that requires overnight, if you're gonna go overnight on a field trip that you have to get uh, superintendent and cabinet level approval. Uh, the new version that's in your board packet of the field trip policy basically just has suggestions for adding some additional language specific to international trips. Um, we've had some international trips that happen outside of the school day. And what's happened is that um, travel agencies will sometimes get in communication with um, people who wanna run them, st teachers, staff, what have you, and they tell them, well, this isn't really a, sk a school district field trip because it's gonna take place on spring break or over a summer um, a summer vacation. And so therefore it's not going to be, um, it's not required for district approval, which is not in fact true. And this is what this policy just basically explicitly lays that out. So um, just adding that explicit language around uh, international field trips are also part subject to district approval and that that's part of the pr proposal that's gonna be in this field trip policy. And that's all in your packet for update. All right, thanks, Christine. I think mm -hmm. this is great, needed. Yeah, and we don't have any international trips planned this year for 2021. The, no, the soonest we would we have any that are coming up would be you know, spring break or summer of 22 and those are still in the works right now. Great. So this is going to be our first reading of this policy. Anybody else comments or questions? Remember, we do three readings. This would be our second reading, our first formal reading. The most in, the informal reading happened on Saturday. And this is your first formal reading in a public board meeting. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add that on Saturday, it was really, really explained to us what the issues were. And we were able to understand what the issues were. So, uh, yeah. All right, anything else on this policy? No. All right, thank you, Christine. Uh, next on the agenda, we have action items. And our first action item is from the business office and it's acknowledgement of contributions. And Ben, I believe you are um, reading those. Yes, I am. Just pulling them up. All right, so Minnesota statute 123B.02 permits school boards to, quote, receive for the benefit of the district bequests, donations, or gifts for any proper purpose and apply the same to the purpose designated. In that behalf, the board may act as trustee of any trust created for the benefit of the district and for the benefit of pupils thereof. Therefore, the director of business services recommends the following resolution. Be it resolved by the school board of independent school district number 622 that the school board accept with appreciation the following contributions 
and permit their use as designated by the donors. So I'm gonna read through the donors. Um, first one we have is Sunday Night Hockey Guys in memory of Joan Reeves in the amount of $125. And the purpose is for Meals on Wheels. We have Marion Drazzle in the amount of $15 for Meals on Wheels. We have Denise Mueller in the memory of Joan Reeves in the amount of $20 for Meals on Wheels. We have Mari Drake in memory of Joan Reeves in the amount of $25 for the Meals on Wheels program. And then finally, we have MinSpec Building Inspection Department, two packet folders, or I'm sorry, two pocket folders, and the purposes for Richardson students and staff. And that brings our total fiscal year 2020-2021 monetary contributions to the total of one, uh, I'm sorry, $14,865.92. Can I get a motion and a second for that? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ben. Okay, moved by Martin, second by Anderson. All in favor, say aye. And Kim will call the roll. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Julia Martins. Aye. Charlotte Natardi. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay, so that motion carries and thank you very much to all those donors. Um, next on our agenda, we have teaching and learning and we have American Indian Parent Advisory Committee letter to the board and resolution. And I think I'm gonna hand it over to Heidi. Yes, thank you. I have the pleasure tonight to introduce Becky Buck. She is our American Indian Education Specialist and she is here to share an exciting update and a letter from the American Indian Parent Committee to the school board along with the committee resolution. So I will turn it over to Becky. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Am I, am I heard? Okay. Um, I am um, going to read this letter that was formed by our parent committee. Um, and it's the letter of concurrent statement. It was created um, February 16th, 2021, to the school board of ISD 622. And again, this is from the American Indian Education Program Parent Committee. Um, the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee has been in partnership with the District 622 for over 12 years. And as a result, our American Indian Education Program was created through this collaboration. We have supported each other to help provide a positive school experience for our students with the goal of creating a higher graduation rate for American Indian students. Each year we come to you with this resolution, asking you as a district to make changes, do more programming, help our students succeed. And each year you have listened to our requests and concerns. And in response, you showed your support by applying those recommendations in concrete ways to help our students. After much talk and consultation, the AIPAC has decided to file a letter of concurrence for the first time in the history of ISD 622 American Indian Education. This, this year's vote represents our belief that ISD 622 has made great efforts to strongly support our American Indian students and the American Indian Education Program. There remains, there remains much work to be done in order to reach the goal of closing the achievement gap and opportunity gap that continue to exist in our American, for our American Indian students. We need to work together. Working with teachers and administrators, we need to increase access to well-vetted American Indian education curriculum and learning tools aligned with the Minnesota state standards for secondary teachers. Extend existing pre-K programming to include culturally relevant parent programming in collaboration with community education to help build strong homeschool relationships and to promote the importance of parent engagement. In order to achieve higher academic levels for American Indian students, we need support from school administrators, counselors, teachers to help connections to district programming or to make 
connections to district programming already available in the areas of avid young scholars tutoring and accessibility to mental health services. We applaud District 62 for its efforts and hope that this work continues with the same sense of urgency and earnestness. Miigwech, pidamiado, thank you, American Indian Parent Advisory Committee. Thank you, Becky. It's been an amazing year, I would say for sure. It has. If, if I could add this morning, we had we have these quarterly tribal consultations um, with uh, the Department of Education and a tribal council, which has got representatives from um, different Indian communities around the state who joined together to serve metro area school districts in a tribal council consultation. And, um, we just had that meeting earlier today and a number of us in this group here, including Michelle Yenner, were in that meeting today um, and had a really great conversation about the work that's happening. And thanks to Becky and her team for some amazing um, work there. And Sharice is overseeing the Office of Educational Equity now too. And um, this, is a, this is the first time in 622 history that we've gotten... Um, a letter of concurrence. And as you know, in Indian education, we get a letter, we have to do a resolution with our Indian ed community every year. And there's an opportunity to sign, there's a document you sign with MDE and you, the, the committee, parent committee checks the box of concurrence, concurrence or not concur concurrence. And it doesn't mean we don't have a lot of work to do and it doesn't mean we don't have a gap and it doesn't mean we don't have a huge heavy lift ahead of us, but it is the first time we've actually gotten the box checked that uh, a letter of concurrence in our district, so. Yes, and you know when when the parent committee was discussing this, um, we looked at all of the things that the school district has um, done for American Indian education programming, and it was unanimous that this vote um, was a yes. And so we say thank you um, for all of your support. Thank you. It's really amazing. I, I'm curious um, what changed. Um, it's amazing work. What did you guys, um, what was, what was the difference between this year and, and the year before or the years before? You know, the achievement gap has always been a huge issue and that gap is still there. Um, we know that it's going to take a lot of work and continued work and support with each other, but with the amount of, um, support that the district has given our program, um, we felt that we would like to give this concurrence um, and we felt very strongly about doing that. And even last year and the year before, it was, you, you, you know, we were torn, um, but acknowledging the fact that we still have this achievement gap that needs to be closed. Um, but we wanted to, to give this concurrence for all of the other things that, um, have been given um, in partnership, the, the work that we've done together and the, the strides that we have made, um, you know, it was really important to the parent committee to, to say yes. That's great. Well, and I also wanna thank you for the work you do as a, just as an individual, as a person, um, the work that you do and the opportunity to review it every year has expanded the lens through which I look at the work the district needs to do. Um, so thank you very much for bringing it to our attention every year. It's been important for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Becky. When you read the sentence about your issue in a concurrence, Steve's face lit up and it stayed lit up the whole time. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, super exciting and it feels so good after feeling so bad for all those years of getting non-concurrent. So we're super thankful to the families um, and also to the whole American Indian Education Program for all the work you guys are doing. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Anything else on this topic or I'll read the resolution. Um, Kim, do I read the full resolution? 
Yes, you're going to start on the whereas part, and then you're going to end right after the be it resolved. Do you see where you're at? Okay. Um, the first whereas. <laughs> uh, you're going to start with whereas school district 622. Okay. Do you see it? All right. Yeah. Okay. So whereas school district 622 affords the AIPAC the necessary information and the opportunity to effectively express their views concerning all aspects of American Indian education and the educational needs of the American Indian children enrolled in the schools and programs. And whereas the AIPAC is directly involved with and advises the school board and district staff on Indian education programs planning. And whereas the AIPAC develops and submits recommendations to the school board and district staff pertaining to the needs of American Indian students. Therefore, be it resolved that the AIPAC concurs that School District 622 is compliant with Minnesota Statute Section 124D.78 and that the school board and districts are meeting the needs of American Indian students. We, the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee, issue a vote of concurrence. We attest that School District 622 is compliant with Minnesota statute and that School District 622 is meeting the needs of American Indian students. Okay. So can I get a motion and a second for approval? So moved. Moved by Natardi, second by, who was second? Is it Anderson? Okay, all in favor say aye and Kim will call the roll. Caleb Anderson. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Julia Martins. Aye. Charlotte Natardi. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay, so that motion is approved. And thanks again to Becky and everybody in the American Indian Education Program, as well as the parents. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is achievement and in integration budget. And Heidi, that's you again. Yes, I have the honor tonight to introduce Sharice Ayers, our Supervisor of Educational Equity. Sharice is going to present the Achievement and in Integration Program budget for the year 2021-2022 and the budget resolution. So I will turn it over to Sharice. Thank you. Um, you actually kind of, everyone froze there for a minute. So I'm presenting the resolutions. Now, I, I thought that Chair Yetter was reading the resolutions. Is that not correct? Yep, I can do that. If I could just make a quick comment. Last year, every three years, we have to uh, resubmit our three-year plan for our achievement and integration, our, our achievement and integration plan. You approved that full plan last year, the three-year plan. So this is just the budget for the upcoming year and which fits within the three-year plan, which you've already approved. So this is just our budget update. Um, I can speak briefly about the budget and some of the things that we're funding. Um, one thing that uh, is a, a big um, change or, or a pivot for us is in um, providing additional support for our American Indian Education Department. And so um, previously we've had a lead position um, that still wasn't a full year position. It wasn't funded year round. And so we're changing that position to coordinator level, um, which will give us someone year round to um, provide summer programming as well as do programming um, and planning year round. And so that's one of the um, additions that we've made in making a commitment to um, provide additional funding for American Indian education. We'll also be funding a camp, um, a American Indian culture and literacy camp this summer uh, with some of the rollover dollars that we were able to carry over from last year. Uh, additionally, some of the programs that we typically fund or always fund um, with our achievement and integration dollars would be young scholars, um, professional development on equity for our staff, 
um, various uh, classroom resources to make sure that we have um, an equitable uh, assortment of curriculum and curriculum options for our students. Also the AVID program um, is funded through the achievement integration dollars, as well as career pathways options in our high schools. Um, our cultural academic support specialists that are in all of our secondary schools, um, our educational equity alliance with Monomedi schools. Um, yeah, so th those are some of the things that we traditionally fund with achievement integration dollars. And then again, um, this year we're taking some of those and um, committing them to um, American Indian education. All right, thank you, Sharice. Any questions or comments? All right, then I will read the resolution. Okay, as part of the Educational Equity Alliance, the collaboration between District 622 and District 832, member districts are eligible for integration revenue. District 622 is expected to receive $2,632,611.94 for achievement and integration in the 2021-2022 year. District 622 is expected to submit a yearly budget around this plan for educational equity. Therefore, the Supervisor of Educational Equity recommends the following resolution. Be resolved by the School Board of Independent School District Number 622 that the District 622 Budget Plan for Achievement and Integration for 2021-2022 be approved. So can I get a motion and a second? So moved. Okay, moved by Martin. Second. Second by Anderson. All in favor say aye. Kim's gonna call the roll. Caleb Anderson. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Julia Martins. Aye. Charlotte Natardi. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. So that motion is approved. And thank you again, Sharice. And thank you, Heidi. Um, next on our agenda, we have the school board. And we have to set agenda time and location for March 2nd, 2021. Um, so I recommend that the March 2nd, 2021 workday session begin at 4.30 p.m. in a virtual format and contain the following agenda items. Number one, WOLD presentation. Number two, capital budget. Number three, 2021-2022 projections, including staffing update, and number four, superintendent check-in, and number five, board check-in. Um, can I get a motion and a second to approve that? So moved. Okay, moved by Livingston. Second. Second by Jarman. All in favor say aye. Caleb Anderson. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Julia Martins. Aye. Charlotte Natardi. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. So that date is approved. Um, thank you. The next thing on our agenda is board communications. Um, ben, do you have anything? Nothing. Um, Nancy? Nothing tonight, thanks. Okay. Um, Caleb? No, not tonight. Steve? Nothing this evening. Okay, uh, Charlotte? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, attending an educational amendment uh, focus group uh, this week, and it's uh, with the Minnesota School Board Association. Uh, they're putting on a focus group, and uh, I'm representing uh, District 6, and there's uh, two of us that are representing District 6. And... Um, so yeah, they're, they're supposed to be 
as most of you know, it's uh, one of the initiative that's being put out. We've seen it on the news, uh, but it's uh, Alan Page is involved in it. And um, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm one of the uh, about 25 people that are participating and their school boards members are uh, participating throughout the whole state of Minnesota and uh, three school board members participating too. So yeah, I'm doing that this week and, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to representing uh, our school district at uh, that meeting and uh, the diversity that we represent in the whole state, so. Yep. All right, thank you, Charlotte. Um, Julia, do you have anything? Nothing specific, but I just kind of wanted to give kudos to Christine for being really diligent and mindful of kind of the COVID changes that are happening. Uh, I appreciate that it isn't a knee jerk reaction because I think that's what a lot of us are worried about. And I mean, I don't think we're going to make everybody happy based on the decisions we have to make. So I just appreciate you doing your due diligence and getting clarification and checking with other districts around us, because that makes us, you know, to the community in our, our district that we did our due diligence in making those decisions. So I really appreciate your effort and um, doing that for us. Hey, Julia, if, if I could interject just one really quick thing, because I know once we um, end this meeting, we're no longer in the public eye and can't have a discussion as a group. Um, I've, I've been doing a little bit of testing just to kind of make sure, you know, that comment I made to you about how we've gotten direction from the state that says, you know, even though you can, I, I'm sorry to go back over this again, but I know I want to keep this in a public eye because obviously it's a public meeting and I don't want to have to try to explain and have discussion offline when we're not, that would violate open meeting law. So um, I've been doing some just back panel checking while we've been sitting here because, you know, I told you that the Minnesota State High School League did issue this guidance that we have the ability to shorten quarantining if certain criteria are met. Um, but we've been told that even if they shorten quarantine, they still can't play in a game for the whole, full 14 days. So I did just verify with our own EDs and with our neighboring districts that they also got that message from MD Minnesota State High School League, and they have. Um, so they've all been told. So this is where kind of the issue lies a little bit. We can shorten the day. They can show up to practice. They have to practice at a distance from other people, and they can do that on a shortened timeline. But it's not going to solve the game issues that the parents were just talking about. And I think that's that's the crux of this discussion, part of what the discussion is going with. Because, um, and I don't, you know, I don't have any problem following the guidance that State High School League is giving, but I want everybody to understand that, and I've just confirmed that we weren't the only ones that got that in an email that said they can't play in a game for 14 days because they still have to keep the six feet of social distancing with other people. And in fact, our, I just checked with our ADs who talked to all the ADs of the others and they're saying everybody's getting the same message from Minnesota State High School League on that issue. So I, just to be clear, because it's not gonna solve, we can shorten the quarantine, but it's not gonna solve the game issues that the parents who we heard from earlier this evening are talking about because the they can practice after a shorter period of time, as long as they stay six feet away from everybody, but they can't really be in a game unless whatever game you're playing allows you to be six feet away from everybody else, which they're saying is not allowable. So I did just confirm with our both of our ADs that that is in fact the message everybody's been getting through the Minnesota State High School League. Now granted, um, there will be some, and, and I know private school sector doesn't always follow the same public school rules. So private school is a little bit different situation, but but even, even if we agree that we're gonna shorten it, the guidance is still that you can't play in a game for 14 days. So that's what I was trying to dig into because I don't wanna make a, an abrupt decision about it. And what I've been finding is people really aren't making major changes because it doesn't really change the fact that you can't play in a game for 14 days. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because I didn't want to send that to you in an email and then open up another can of worms for discussion when we are not in a public meeting. So I just wanted you to be clear. I, I want to just be clear what that issue is. There is this guidance that if certain criteria are met, you can shorten your quarantine timeline. However, you still can't play in a game 
for 14 days because you still have to maintain, even if you go back to practices, you still have to keep six feet from between you and other people. So that's the issue right now. Michelle, are you hearing right, something different with that? Because that's, that's, it feels like maybe you have a different perception about that issue than I do. That's what I want to be, that's why I want to bring it up in a meeting. And I don't want to go in circles. I just want to be clear we're on the same page about that because I don't want to end the meeting and then be like, I, wait a minute. I haven't did a lot of, I haven't done a lot of research into it. I just literally looked up the Minnesota Department of Health guidance and the Minnesota State High School League was linking out to the guidance from Minnesota Department of Health. And I just saw that there's new guidance that had been issued. It's one page long. It's not, you know, overly cumbersome or complicated to read. And it did appear to give, you know, parents and kids the option to not quarantine as long. And I think for those of us who have kids in sports or who have heard about their experiences, we kind of get why that guidance was issued. And so I feel like me personally, as a sports parent, I, I have been consistent that we need to follow the guidance from Minnesota Department of Health. But when the guidance tells us that it's okay, I feel like it's okay. The guidance though, even the guidance you're referencing and I'll forward this to the whole board, even the guidance you're referencing still says six feet for the full 14 days. I'll share it with you, but I did, the reason, the reason this didn't come up before today was just our ADs had already looked at it and said, this really doesn't change game day experiences. It can bring kids back to practices sooner and that's great. We can certainly do that, but it doesn't allow for earlier participation in a game. And when I asked my neighboring superintendents, if that's what they've also been hearing from Minnesota State High School League, they've been hearing the same thing. You can practice after okay. a shorter period of time, but you, you still can't be in a game. I know that after this meeting, I mean, not tonight, but in the next couple of days, you guys are going to review it and come together for a recommendation. And I'm I'm sure that the district will do what's right. So. No, no, no. I agree. I just, I wanted the rest of the board to just understand what the issue was because it felt like we were like having a disconnect there. And I just, the issue is that the Minnesota State High School League now says you can have a shorter quarantine. The reason our district has not, and I, when I district, I mean our health department, our, our Alicia, our team there, our ADs haven't recommended we make a dramatic change is because it doesn't change the ability to play in a game. Because in that guidance, the state high school league and the health department have both been directing people to say, even if you have a shorter quarantine, you can practice sooner, but you still can't play in a game sooner. And that's, that's why it hasn't felt like it's actually that big of a difference. It's a, it's a definite, it can get kids back to practice sooner though, for sure. I just want, I want the rest of our board to understand that. And I, I'll send you all exactly the exact, exact language we're talking about. What Michelle and I are both referencing so that we, cause you don't have it in front of you at the same time we do, but I want you to understand that that's, that's the crux of what we're discussing tonight. And I didn't want anyone to leave here tonight not understanding that that was the issue we're talking about. All right, thanks, Christine. Yeah. Okay, and thanks, Julia, for your comments as well. Thank you, Julia. Um, <laughs> did we get to everyone? I think we did. I do want to make a couple of comments. Um, as I think both of you know that I serve on the ISD 622 board, which is our intermediate um, board. And this month, it's National Career and Tech Education Month. So you mean we had guests. You said 622, you mean 916. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. And so we had um, a student from White Bear Lake come and tell us about her experience with the cosmetology tech program, where as a high school student, she's going to get licensed so then she can earn money um, while she's going through college. And we also heard from a Turton high school student who was in the criminal justice and law enforcement and plans to pursue a career. And it's just great to hear from those students because they're the ones who are earning cre college credits a lot of times while they're in high school. Um, and we also learned that their career in tech building at 916 has a new welding lab, um, a big welding lab. And they asked us to invite all of our school boards if any of you are interested in taking a tour of the 916 facilities, including that new lab, um, Kim could help us 
arrange a tour over there. And then it's um, Christy uh, mentioned. Michelle. Uh -huh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm one of those new board members that is still, I'm, I'm waving my card for being new. Uh, where do we get that information from? Kim. <laughs> So okay. if you email yeah. him, he knows okay. everything. Charlotte, throughout the throughout the year, 916 will often feature program tours. And so they'll invite school boards at that time. But also, like Michelle mentioned, when that's when they're highlighting certain programs, they open it up. And so once once we know that that's happening, if you have any interest in, in touring this program, let me know and I'll connect with 916 and we'll get something set up for you. I am interested. Perfect. Good. I'll put you down. Okay. All right. Um, and then, as Christine mentioned, it's School Board Appreciation Week, and I just want you all to know that I appreciate each of you, and I really appreciated the retreat this last weekend, and I know it's sometimes hard, but it's all good. Um, and then just one more thing is thank you to our teachers and staff um, just for the work that they're doing each day. I know sometimes they feel steamrolled with COVID and all the changes and adjusting and adjusting again and adjusting again. So I just want them to know that we really do, really, really do appreciate their efforts and um, thank you for educating our children. Um, we have future board meeting dates. We have March 2nd, 2021 work study session. We have March 23rd, 2021 board business meeting at 6 p.m. And with that, unless there's any final comments, no, then I will ask for a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Okay, moved by Livingston. Second. Second by Anderson. All in favor say aye. Caleb Anderson. Aye. Steve Hunt. Aye. Ben Jarman. Aye. Nancy Livingston. Aye. Julia Martins. Aye. Charlotte Natardi. Aye. Michelle Yenner. Aye. Okay, and 